Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome back to my channel. Um, today I thought I would try a tag for the first time. Um, and this is a tag that is by uh, The Bar and the Bookcase. And the tag is also called The Bar and the Bookcase. Uh, and I thought this was a really exciting one to start with. I think I'm norm normally a little bit nervous around some of the tags that I've seen, just because I'm very aware that um, there are many of the answers that I w I'm not necessarily sure how I would go about. Uh, kind of responding to uh, but uh, this one I, I really liked and I thought I'd give it a go um, and hopefully I'll do a few more in future. I'm still definitely overdue to do one for um, Daniel over at Guilty Feet. He's got a really good uh, tag, the effed up tag that I really want to try and do. Anyway, um, so uh, I thought I'd start with some of these and as much as possible I think I've managed to limit this to only one book that was nominated for the Booker Prize, which, you know, that's growth. <laughs> so um, I'm going to do that. You know, I'm showing the judges versatility. I'm showing that I have other books that I have read that are not Booker Prize books, um, sort of. We'll see. Anyway, so let's get started. Um, so all of these are themed around um, uh, kind of cocktails and various drinks. Um, and I love how kind of creative this is in terms of thinking about um, a prompt that kind of relates to a certain drink itself. So the first one is the old fashioned and this is um, a, a recommendation that you're making based on historical fiction and I'm now realizing as I'm about to say this that I've stacked my books in the over the side here in a completely horrible random order which does not work and so now I will <laughs> move behind the scenes to find it. Uh, but my historical recommendation is Hamnet um, with a little price tag on it as well. There we go. Well, three pound off sticker from Waterstones. Um, so Hamnet, um, I've sort of spoken about a little bit on the channel before, particularly around the Women's Prize um, and in sort of my wrap up of 2020. It was one of my absolute favourite books from last year. Um, so Hamnet goes into the story um, of Agnes, or sort of Anne um, Hathaway, who is the wife um, of William Shakespeare. And it's her sort of going through her life as she sort of reckons with various sort of spiritual or sort of supernatural kinds of gifts, as it were, that she has alongside um, her children. Um, and the sort of main, one of the main things at the heart of it is that she is very worried that um, uh, she kind of gets a premonition that she, um, uh, when she dies, there'll be two people, uh, two of her children watching over her. Um, and at that stage, she has, I think, three children. So she's sort of scared that one of them will die. Um, and when um, the kind of title character, uh, well, when Hamnet himself, the son, does die, um, that's not a spoiler, it's kind of told right, pretty much at the, at the back of the book. Um, but uh, it's this kind of beautiful sort of evocation of how this mother... Um, uh, mourns this loss and how she kind of processes it and for, for her husband Shakespeare he also sort of then writes um, the play Hamlet um, which is where it's believed it's sort of related to and it, kind of just so many beautiful touching moments in this um, and I, I think every time I've spoken about it I ramble about this exact moment as well but there is a moment of about five pages sort of somewhere in the middle where we just track fleas um, for a few um, yeah, for a few pages, um, which doesn't sound like it would be the most exciting thing, but it's basically to show sort of the spread of uh, the Black Death and how it was basically all, I said that far too cheerily, the Black Death! Um, how the, the kind of, yeah, the, the sort of, how that was uh, tracked and how that spread and, and kind of, you know, decimated so much of, um, of the world. Um, at that time. So yeah, it's kind of, uh, I, I just think an absolutely beautiful book and a book that I will always keep on recommending. Um, I think pretty much it, always. Um, and I now need to go back and read a lot more Maggie, uh, Maggie O'Farrell as a result. So yeah, there we go. That's the first one. Next up is The Sidecar. And this is all about a book with a strong supporting character. Um, and for this, this is a book that I've read recently and I'm going to do a sort of separate video on. Um, and that is A Burning by Mega Majumdar. Um, now, it's kind of a bit weird in some ways to say a supporting character in this book because the whole thing is sort of told as sort of a, a sort of three-way narrative. Um, but, you know, a large part of it is focused on this one woman at the heart of it who is um, on trial um, for kind of, it's believed that she's sort of been um, sympathising with and supporting terrorists um, and kind of has committed a terrorist act that is sort of, it's believed. Um, and kind of in the midst of all of that, um, it kind of follows these three characters through um, 
uh, through the whole kind of situation. I mean, I think what's so beautiful is there's a character in this uh, called Lovely, who is a hijra, and she um, just goes through the book in such an interesting way. She's her, for me, I found her narrative the most compelling. Um, she's not the main character, but she kind of is involved in the plot in various ways. Um, and I just think she is so well, I, I was really, rooting for her the entire book. I just found her so endearing and so charming. Um, and she's kind of forced into some quite difficult decisions throughout the book, but she's an aspiring actress who just has all of this kind of both, this kind of really touching quality where she's both really, um, has a her sort of head in the clouds about this big dream of being a big film star, uh, but at the same time is really quite grounded and is kind of like, oh, you know, I'm perfecting my craft so I can be a really good actress. Um, and she's kind of caught in all of these sort of interstices of various moments and I just love her. So I think, yeah, Lovely from A Burning is just such a great character and one who I just found myself rooting for the entire time. Um, and the next prompt, uh, on a very, very different um, sort of move in some ways, is uh, just kind of destroying things while I'm finding this book. There we go. Lovely. This is why you should prepare this a little bit more, Bob. Um, so <laughs> the next is um, a, a book set in New York. And originally I was going to use A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara, but I managed to find a way of doing this without the Booker Prize. Way. Um, I was also thinking briefly of My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Atosa, uh, Otessa Moshveg, but that was actually the one that that um, uh, the bottom of the bookcase used for, for the tag. So I thought I'd go for something a little bit different, um, which is a book I absolutely adored, which is the play, um, The Inheritance by Matthew Lopez, um, which is set in New York. It's sort of a modern day kind of retelling or adaptation of um, Howard's End by Ian Forster. And it um, looks a lot at uh, sort of various parts of um, queer and LGBTQ life um, in the US and particularly around, uh, for example, the AIDS crisis um, and in terms of modern day Trump America, essentially. Um, there's this really powerful moment where um, some of these kind of well-meaning kind of li uh, wealthy liberal kind of characters are talking about, oh, you know, of course Hillary's going to win, you know, nobody will ever vote for Trump. And obviously we as the audience are reading this knowing what happened, um, which is kind of heartbreaking. <laughs> grim uh, but yeah you know all of these kind of these gay men at one point talking about how great their lives are and how it's going to keep on getting better and better and how you know everything's heading forward and getting better you know improving all the time and of course then Hillary Clinton's going to come in and it's going to keep getting better and then obviously we know the kind of rollbacks to LGBTQ rights that happened with Trump um, so I think it's really interesting um, as, as a way of sort of this play working and I, I especially love how it kind of uses the, the story of Howard's End and adapts it in such a beautiful and interesting way um, to really look at kind of queer communities and how they support each other. Um, and I just thought it was uh, absolutely brilliant and I loved it. <laughs> there we go. Um, and we've got some sunlight to kind of coincide with that. There we go. Um, and next um, is a book um, that scared you or messed you up. And for this, I... Um, I went with a book that uh, kind of messed me up in quite a strange way. Um, hang on, let me just find it again. Um, this is um, by one of my absolute favourite authors, uh, Jan Martel, uh, but it's not his book of one. It's uh, Beatrice and Virgil, um, which is uh, this really interesting story um, that, again, on the surface, doesn't really sound like it would make that much sense. It's um, uh, these two characters, uh, th these two animals on a crest on a shirt, um, and they are kind of discussing things throughout the whole story, which again really shouldn't work. Um, but what I just think is so um, brilliant is the kind of all the way through the journey, it's done sort of so subtly and kind of gently. You know, it's quite jovial and happy for a lot of the book. And then there is this one moment that is just so brutal that comes out of absolutely nowhere. Um, and um, it messed me up because I just did not see it coming. So I'm getting a lot of glare on these glasses. Uh, it messed me up in, in so many ways because it was just so sudden. And it's the first time where I've been reading a book and I've had to physically stop. And like, you know, my chest was pounded, my heart was pounding and I just could not. Uh, yeah, it, it completely threw me. And um, I was not expecting that <laughs> from this book because it started off so kind of like, you know, some interesting things and they're sort of discussing world history. Um, and I think this is something that's always just so clever for me about Jan Martel's work is 
there is a kind of an overall principle an idea that's kind of introduced quite early on and so much of the book is themed around that so in life of pi like this idea of multiple stories and whose is the right story and you know religions tell you know you have different sort of stories which ones do we believe um and all of those kinds of things uh and in self there's a lot about kind of transformations and about gender uh, and kind of other things um in beatrice and virgil we get this really interesting kind of discussion about yeah world history and about brutality but we sort of seem sort of inured from it in some way throughout the book um and then suddenly this big violent moment happens and it just throws you and you're like no <laughs> like oh my gosh like what has just happened and i just remember reading this and being like oh you like this is my kind of i can't without sort of fully swearing on this like clever Jan Martel uh, this is his sort of typical thing where he will just sort of suddenly do something like oh okay right you're a genius like damn you <laughs> uh but no I, I loved it and yeah Beatrice and Virgil completely messed me up at the time um and I'm a bit nervous about going back to reread it because um yeah it's um but it's beautiful it's a really well done book after, after saying all that um Super. And then on to uh, something a little bit perhaps lighter um, after that is um, a book that kept you into uh, reading it late into the night. Sorry, I keep on forgetting to mention the drink names for this. So Bloody Mary is the, the book that scared you or messed you up. Um, an Espresso Martini, um, the book that kept you reading into the night. And that for me was Maxwell's Demon, which I've spoken about a fair bit recently. Um, I think kind of as I mentioned in sort of separate video about uh, Maxwell's Demon, um, I intended to read about 50 pages of it and I ended up reading all roughly 350 um, or so pages in just one sitting. Um, I just absolutely fell in love with it and um, I think I had work the next day and everything but I was like no I need to finish this, this is just such a gorgeous and interesting book and it's so compelling and so interesting in so so many ways uh, that I just thought yeah I absolutely have to um, finish this now because I know that I won't you know when you when sometimes when you're really into a book and you know that if you go back to it the next day you won't have that same momentum as much as you might be less tired and therefore a bit more able to kind of engage with it you might you, you kind of lost a bit of that rhythm where sometimes when you're so into it you just kind of need it to keep going um, and that's exactly what happened with me um with maxwell's demon by stephen hall um, which i just i just love very very experimental and kind of playful and um just really compelling for me i think as well so number six, uh, Sazerac, which is, or Sazerac, I, I don't know how to pronounce this. I've never had one. Um, a book that left you disoriented, uh, which is such a, a great prompt and such a really interesting one. The one I went for for this is a nonfiction work, and it left me disoriented mostly for the reason that it just is so. It's quite grim reading. Um, so this nonfiction book is uh, Men Who Hate Women by Laura Bates, and I think from the title alone you can tell why it was maybe disorienting. Um, so this is a book all about about um, online, well, not uh, online and offline, um, kind of hatred towards women, um, particularly based around movements like incels or um, kind of men's rights advocates and those sorts of groups um, where there is a lot of really toxic um, language and behaviour towards women. Um, and Laura Bates basically went undercover for, I want to say, a year and a half, two years. Um, where she would, um, she was sort of on some of these forums for her um, and uh, kind of inter <clears throat> interacting with men um, who were kind of, you know, making death threats and rape threats to women. They were boasting about how they wanted to do various things. They saw women as entirely beneath them. Um, I mean, disgusting, grim, horrible, horrible stuff. And this is, you know, Laura Bates as well, who received tons of death and rape threats um, after publishing things like the Everyday Sexism uh, blog um, and just kind of a few of her other kind of more sort of vocal campaigns. Um, and so sometimes, you know, she would see herself um, being described on some of these, uh, these sort of online uh, forums and rooms and, and things like that, um, which is, I, I can't even imagine how she did that. And then for me the, the strength and courage to then to not only delve into that but then to come back out of it and to write this book um and kind of also again potentially expose herself to even more threats even more damage and so that that's why this book was so sort of disorienting and unsettling for me um was it's not easy reading it's really quite 
rough at times um, and I sometimes made the mistake of reading this book, you know, trying to read a chapter of this book before going to bed. Um, that does not lend itself well to nice dreams or to even really being able to fall asleep in the first place. Um, so I was very disoriented by this book, but all of that said, it's such a vital and brilliant book, um, so well researched, so well thought out, so well argued, um, that I really think it's worth checking out. Uh, a little bit of a bummer on this list in that sense of kind of a book that I is just so, ugh, but um, yeah, really important and really worth it. Um, and I can't say it's necessarily going to get happier with this next one, uh, which is uh, Long Island Iced Tea. Uh, so this prompt is all about a book that is doing too much. Now, um, as opposed to Long Island Ice Teas, which uh, just get me too drunk, uh, as I've found, and especially now at this stage in lockdown, I have no alcohol tolerance, so this is great. Uh, I feel drunk already, just talking, just saying the names of these cocktails. Um, so, uh, for me, a book that is doing too much um, and doesn't work, unfortunately for me, is um, Umbrella by Will Self. This is the only Booker Prize one that's mentioned on this. Ah. Uh, it's the only reason I also persevered with that book as well. I think I should have stopped reading it about 50 pages in. Um, so essentially, for me, so much about the premise and idea of this book is great. Um, it's the idea that there's a woman who is, um, who's kind of moments of her life are kind of coming to her in flashes um, and she I believe has either dementia or Alzheimer's I want to say um, and so her th whole thought uh, process is entirely broken and kind of uh, patchy and you know all it's and so the text reflects that and in on like on paper in like that to me sounds like something I would really enjoy like that kind of experimental idea you know where the the form and, and kind of things play around with each other um, but for me what makes it kind of too much is that um, I I found it basically unreadable uh, because it'll be like maybe three or four words um, of one thought and then another thought kind of interrupting and then another sort of thought interrupting and some of that in italics, some of it not. Um, and sometimes, you know, there'll be um, snatches where it kind of goes, um, you know, it'll be like a, a bit of a song. And, you know, whereas something like uh, Ducks Newburyport really works for me in that sense, um, Umbrella, which is only 350 pages as opposed to Ducks New Report's thousand pages, somehow just did not work at all. Um, it's all one sentence pretty much. I don't think, well, I think there are sentence breaks, but there are no page breaks or line breaks. Um, so it is sort of 300, 350 pages of just sort of that. And for me, I found that too much because it, it, I, I didn't know when to stop with each time. I felt like I was taking nothing in and I'm, I'm kind of baffled. I know that some people, this is the thing, I know that some people love it. I mean, that some of them must have it ended up on the shortlist um, in the 2012 Booker Prize. So I don't really, I, I don't know what I've missed. Maybe if I reread it, I would absolutely adore it and I'd get something from it. But for me, it left me so cold because I just couldn't find an avenue into this book at all. Um, and so for me, it felt like too much because there were too many voices and sort of bits of voices happening at once. And so I, if you ask me anything about what happened in that story, I think at one point something about the war and at one point something about like a cockney a bit of cockney rhyming slang that is all i remember from 300 pages of that book and i read it last year so <laughs> there we go um yes anyway <sighs> so next is a um a, a book with a love triangle and the prompt for this one is um is a negroni and for me uh the, uh, I, I had to really rack my brains on this because I realised maybe I just don't read that many books that have anybody with any kind of l loving relationship in them. <laughs> um, but a uh, book with a love triangle. Um, eventually managed to find one that um, I thought was a really good example of this, which is uh, My Sister, the Serial Killer by Ayinkan Braithwaite, um, which I just think is such a fun, um, interesting book. So it is a kind of... Um, Almost, it feels a bit kind of thrill thrillery at times um, as well, but it's it's um, these two sisters, um, one of whom, as you may be able to guess from the title, is a serial killer. And uh, she sort of kills um, her sort of boyfriends. Um, and at first you sort of think that it might be, it's sort of presented as if it's maybe, you know, these have been happening by accident. It may be, you know, her there was sort of a manslaughter incident or something else happened for her first boyfriend to die. But no, it, it happens, I think, three times across the whole book. Um, and, uh, and then at one point, I mean, one of the final ones, this doesn't spoil it too much, I don't think. Um, one of the final ones, uh, the, um, the good sister, the one who hasn't been killing everyone. <laughs> 
she there's this man who she really likes and she's been trying to avoid um, any situation where her sister might meet the man not only because her sister is this kind of beautiful flirty very charming woman who all men seem to favor over over the good sister so it's not only that factor that she kind of fears that she may take her away from her but also you know she's been killing people she's been dating so she doesn't want to see this guy uh, killed but we kind of then do a, see a situation where both women are really into this man and um it I don't want to sort of spoil how kind of things go towards the end of the book, but for me, what's so brilliant about the way this is handled is um, that it it once that kind of those final cards drop where you realise um, that the, the two characters have met now, it just becomes this moment of watching these two women kind of trying to outmaneuver each other um, for the affections of this man and trying to stop the other one from interfering with their plan. Um, and it, it's just so well done and really interesting. And um, it was just such a fun book, I thought. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Okay. <laughs> So I was about to read the next ones in the wrong order, which would have massively changed them, given that uh, Bay Breeze, the first prompt, uh, is a book with a light, chill or heartwarming vibes. Um, and <laughs> uh, the next one is Dark and Stormy, a book that's dark, thrilling and menacing. Those are quite different feels, uh, so I'm glad that I didn't accidentally mix that up. But, and you'll see why when I mention which ones they are, why these probably could not be mixed up. Um, the first one, so this light, chill, heartwarming vibes for the Bay Breeze. Um, I chose The Accidental Tourist by Anne Tyler. I've spoken about it a bit recently. Um, but uh, thanks to Daniel over at Guilty Feet, I went and checked out some more of um, Anne Tyler's back catalogue. And The Accidental Tourist is probably one of her most famous ones, I think. Um, and in it, there's just sort of this really touching love story um, between sort of a few characters and particularly this main kind of character who's very stuck in the mud, Macon, um, who again, as I sort of mentioned before, my sort of February read um, roundup, I think it was, that um, I thought was called Megan for the entire audiobook, uh, pretty much. <laughs> um, but Macon, uh, he um, is a bit of a stick in the mud kind of character. He is um, very kind of set in his ways. He kind of does the same things every day and sort of all those kinds of bits. And uh, he there's this kind of love story with him and um, uh, this kind of woman who, uh, Muriel, who's a bit kind of uh, a bit more chaotic, let's say, um, and in some ways we kind of do wonder, is this what he needs? Does he need... I'm getting loads of light, look at this, yes! <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, uh, he gets lots of... Uh, he, you know, she's sort of so chaotic, so kind of um, spontaneous, and it's kind of that classic, you know, mismatched kind of couple thing. Will he get back with his uh, his former partner? Will he go with Muriel? And it's just nice. It's just a lot of nice characters dealing with horrible situations and just being nice. <laughs> um, I probably also could say um, Dinner at the Homesick Restaurant um, or Breathing Lessons uh, by Anne Tyler as well for this. Anne Tyler's very good at those kind of chilled, heartwarming kind of stories where there are nice people um, doing mostly nice things. <laughs> and that's not to discredit it. She does those very well um, and it's just so beautiful and fun to read. Um, and it's a nice break from some of the other things <laughs> I've been reading. Uh, so yes, I would go for that. Um, and then Dark and Stormy. So a book that's dark, thrilling and menacing. Um, and this is another book I read fairly recently, which is Sorrowland by River Solomon, um, which I just thought was so beautiful. It's kind of sci-fi fantasy in parts. It's um, it has sort of so many other elements to it, but essentially it's largely around um, a woman who escapes from um, some kind of essentially compound, um, but it, the compound is a bit cult-like, um, but when she then sort of goes on the run, um, there are all these other people trying to sort of track her down and she's there with her two children um, and they're kind of living this really kind of in nature kind of life. Um, and for me, I just thought it was just so brilliantly done um, because it's so compelling and so uh, just gripping the entire way through. Um, and that menacing element that is in the prompt is so true here. It, it's There's always a threat that something's going to happen. We also start learning more and more about the character, about the kind of cult kind of compound that she's left and all these other things that just make this story come together in really fascinating ways. Um, I don't think it's out yet. I think it will be shortly. I think it comes out in May. 
Uh, but yeah, I just thought it was an absolutely stunning piece of work and um, I'm really glad I read it. Uh, my first from River Solomon and I've heard excellent things. Um, and finally, uh, Martini. Uh, so a classic recommendation. Um, and I'm hoping this kind of counts as sort of being old enough for a classic. I think it does. Um, and that is Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin. Um, and I absolutely adore this book. I mean, I think so much has been said about it by so many other people, but it's such a brilliantly told love story um, and um, kind of snapshot into a very specific bit of, um, of gay life at a very specific time. James Baldwin, as always, is just an absolute master when it comes to um he's just like he's just a king of words it's just brilliant to see um everything i read of his i kind of start off and kind of like you know kind of I, I kind of almost forget each time how good he is um and then i sort of start reading a book of his i'm like oh yeah <laughs> he's great um uh, there's a reason he's he's thought of so highly uh and yeah he is just such a brilliant writer and again like a book like this uh, Giovanni's Room is just it's beautiful it's tender it's heartbreaking it's so cleverly observed um, it never feels like the characters are being pitied um, really it's kind of it feels very warm and human and I, I just love it um, and that would be yeah that for me um, anyway so in terms of tagging people which I've never done I feel a bit awkward doing this I mean do this if you want if I forget to tag you entirely and it's something that would appeal to you but uh, I will tag some people who I um, have been really enjoying uh, reading so that would be drumroll while I think of some people for this list so I'd really love to um, uh, to tag i forgot the word there i was like nominate no that's not really the word um so i'd like to tag um uh, daniel over at guilty feet um i think he'd have some really interesting um ones for this same for uh bookish and mark nash um and i would also really love uh, to get the kind of thoughts of um people like aj dunn reads and writes um their channel is so interesting and they have so many book recommendations that I've just sort of, of books that I just don't know at all which is always always fascinating for me and uh, Ben over at Doom Antidote I think would be really fun for this challenge as well. Meanwhile I'm being inundated by light which looks like I'm about to be sort of raptured up uh, through my window uh, which would be rather lovely for this Sunday morning um, but oh it's Saturday what day are we on? Saturday yes okay <laughs> Saturday at time of filming. Um, anyway uh, thank you to the bar in the bookcase that's been the bar in the bookcase tag um, uh, his channel's really interesting and really fun as well. I urge you to go and check it out. And, um, yeah, why don't I have a little look? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, anyway, I've been Bob the Booker. Here are some books that I've spoken about that are mostly non-Booker Prize uh, books. Yay! <laughs> uh, and uh, I hope you have a great time reading um, and hopefully enjoying some of this sunshine if you are in the UK or in anywhere else. <laughs> uh, take care and I hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye.